Hi, and welcome to Coffee with the Chairman, where we speak to the incredibly talented Canadian and Canadian alumni community here in the UAE and speak to its members to get their point of view and their outlook. Today, I'm joined by Taufik Rahim, the Executive Director of Globesight. Hi, Taufik, how are you? Good, good to see you. Thank you very much for joining us. So, I know that Globesight focuses a lot on development particularly aligned with the UN's develop millennial, Millennium Development Goals. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself, what got you into this business, and, and what Globesight does? Sure. Uh, so definitely we're focused on the Sustainable Development Goals as successor to the uh, Millennium Development Goals, where wow. the world is trying to achieve uh, essentially a new standard of living for all uh, by 2030. Uh, I bring together a background in strategy, development, and the social sector, and that's really the impetus for building Globesight. And here from Dubai and now around the world, where we can connect the global east and south into the conversations that are predominantly you know, being held in the west. Right. Uh, we want to kind of reshape uh, how those partnerships and strategies are being uh, undertaken. That's fascinating. So you have a background in strategy. Mm -hmm. What is it that drove you into this line of work uh, at this point in time? Obviously. There has been you know, never more need for this type of work, uh, given the situation that we're in at the moment. What drove you into it, Tafrik? Well, I think it's the moment, you know, uh, Uda. Uh, you know, we are at a time where, while we've had tremendous progress uh, around the world, and we've seen that even here in Dubai, we also have unparalleled uh, levels of inequality. Correct. And we have a true uh, divergence uh, between the global east and south kind of emerging, right, mm -hmm. as we see this apocal shift uh, economically. And so we need to have new ways of thinking if we're going to find ways to advance solutions to some of the largest you know, challenges that face us. Obviously, we're in the midst of one of course. With, the, with the pandemic, but we've seen that with the humanitarian situation across uh, the Middle East. And in the future, uh, obviously, we're going to have to deal very assertively with climate change. So, you know, all of these bring together a moment and which is one of the reasons why we're driving the work that we do at Globesight. Fantastic. So one of the, your most recent reports is on 2030 and the efforts to bring uh, to and the goals that need to be associated mm -hmm. with achieving our goals for 2030. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about your work in this regard? Sure. You know, we work uh, significantly behind the scenes with some of the largest philanthropic and international uh, organizations in the world. Right. Uh, but, you know, with that connectivity, we have really an ability to reshape and reframe the conversation. And that's why we're launching 2030 dot solutions this year uh, around the time of the UN General Assembly in September mm. uh, to really put more thinking out there that challenges the prevailing thinking around some of the challenges that you see around the sustainable development goals that you mentioned. Interesting. How can we do things differently, uh, leveraging some of the talent resources uh, that exist out there today? That's fascinating. So, of course, one of the challenges that we have when we talk about sustainable development is, is the sort of leapfrogging issue for developing mm -hmm. for the, the Global East, as you say, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you can't, it, the, the Global East cannot progress into its development path mm -hmm. in the same way that the West did, yeah. because that would, that would then result in a climate catastrophe. What do you think are the major challenges? Do people accept that logic, or is that logic still relatively far away from, you know, for the, from the leaders of countries who think that, listen, mm -hmm. you know, the West did it, so then we have to go through it as well. Right. I mean, I don't think we're going to see any type of, you know, halt to the way India, for example, develops, or even now, large parts of Africa are developing. They're going to need to deliver for the livelihoods of their people. Correct. And so we're going to need to have, you know, kind of a tripartite focus. One is that you have indigenous voices as part of the conversation. Uh, the second is collaboration across the private, public, and social sectors. Okay. So when we see this leapfrogging, if you've seen it in other countries historically, whether it's Singapore, etc., it's not just an NGO coming in. It's actually the private sector that's very much at the forefront of this. So we need to make sure we have an inclusive conversation that brings that collaboration. And then finally, I think there's real trade-offs to be made, you know? Right. Uh, and that's the discussion that we need to have openly uh, because, you know, everything has... Uh, a concurrent result, you know, when you're going in one direction, something else can happen in another. And, and how would you rate Canada's participation uh, in, this, in this realm? I think Canada needs to do better. I okay. think we're really great at uh, being Canada 
in Canada. Okay. Uh, and despite having such a significant and great diaspora community, uh, especially here in Dubai and the great work that the Canadian Business Council does in bringing that together, I think we have to find more ways to plug those voices into the conversation back home Correct. for a more creative and innovative foreign policy uh, and trade effort uh, abroad. And that's, I, think, I think you're on exactly the right path, uh, Dr. I mean, I agree with you. The, mm -hmm. the diaspora is, 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 is massive. And I think that the way in which the diaspora, we as, as Canadians living abroad, plug into the mothership in Canada yes. um, is, I think, often overlooked. Um, what do you think are the, the major milestones that you're looking forward to over 2021? What, what do you think in, in this line of work uh, will be the, the determining factor of whether we're moving in the positive way towards 2030 uh, or to, in a negative way towards 2030? Yeah, I mean, it's an, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think the prevailing uh, consensus is going to be to turn to places like the World Economic Forum, etc., to set agendas. And we'll right. see these videos coming out around, you know, the climate solution, etc. I think what I'm going to look for is say, do we have really organic institutions and voices from what I mentioned, the global east and south, mm. actually out there in the forefront and shaping the agenda, as well as Western institutions listening to that agenda. Right. And I don't think it's any more a matter of choice because the way the world and the power structures and the economics are uh, constructed today, you need to have that listening and you need to have that meeting ground because otherwise uh, you might make a decision, uh, let's say in Canada or in Europe, but it's not going to be implemented globally, right? And we see the forces shaping the economy here in Dubai. It's not just coming from one direction. Of course not. Yeah. yeah, we see it from all all sides, and that's fascinating. So, of course, you have a there's a lot of complexity there yes. when you're talking about building a broader civic society yeah. in addition to building the NGO scene yeah. as well as the private sector. Yeah, are there any uh, countries that you've worked in so far that uh, you know, the UAE accept, accepted that really say, look, this is the model and it's mm -hmm. and, and it's reaping benefits here in this yeah. in this country. Which which government's got it right? Which civic society's got it right? Yeah, I mean, it's tough. I don't think there's one uh, size solution. You look at Bangladesh, where you've had tremendous economic growth, uh, unparalleled in some respects over the last decade. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's actually a significant opportunity in there. We've seen an advance in livelihoods of a great number of people. But there are challenges to the civil society development. Got it. Um, you'll see kind of a similar economic development in India, but then you have to say, is it inclusive growth? Correct. Uh, you know, I think you know a lot of these countries would benefit from actually more conversations with each other to see where they can learn from, because I don't think there's one model that's working. It's mm -hmm. kind of bits of models that are working in in uh, different places, and obviously people go back to you know the Asian tigers and Singapore and South Korea and Taiwan, you know, as the benchmarks, um, and they might still be in terms of the ones that really made this comprehensive leap uh, over the last 20, 30 years. It's interesting you say that because when people think back to Asian success stories and from a development perspective, um, they do think about Taiwan and Singapore, but they forget about Indonesia, which was also mm -hmm. one of the Asian tigers. Mm -hmm. um, and in Indonesia in the 90s, you saw a lot of the challenges with big, complicated Asian countries uh, trying to, as I said, you know, leapfrog. Uh, over, it's incredible that this is the world in which you're living, in which you're working, and you know, kudos to you, Tofik, uh, for moving the world uh, world forward in this regard. Um, we, at the CBC, are here to support you 100%. So let us know what we can do, and and your point about the Canadian diaspora is well taken. Uh, we're, we're here to push that agenda forward. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time, Tofik. 